Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Are we here this morning? Y'all stand. Y'all stand up. We're going to start this morning with a little high energy. You okay with that? So let's start this. Let's start like this. Like this. With me. Y'all ready? I wondered so aimless, life filled with sin. I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night, singing praise the Lord. I saw the light. I saw the light. I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside, singing praise. A blind man I wandered alone Worries and fears I've claimed for my own Then like a blind man who God gave back his sight Singing, praise the Lord I saw the light I saw the light I saw the light No more darkness No more night So happy, no sorrow inside Singing, praise seated. If you're visiting with us this morning, we just want to invite you to, to fill out the visitor's co- uh, a form that's right in the pew right in front of you. That's the green one. Uh, and place that in our offering tray a little later on in our service this morning. Uh, but I got a couple of things I want to go over with you uh, in our bulletins this morning, church family. Um, a couple of things. We are going to be starting up a new children's program this fall. Uh, it's going to be Leaders in Training. Leaders in training, and it's really focusing on producing those leaders, making those disciples, equipping, preparing our children. Um, It's going to still be a good, fun time for them, uh, really getting them into God's word. Um, And so we're excited about that. It's going to be leaders in training, but then for our small kids, it's going to be Nehemiah kids, Nehemiah kids. And Christy is excited about this. She's really been putting a lot of her time and energy into it, so uh, please, church family, if, if you're a parent with this, she's going to have an orientation just to lay out everything for you about this on July 19th at 5 p.m. She's just going to have a quick orientation, walk you through it, 
go over why she has made these kinds of changes, and I promise that you're going to walk away really believing in this program. So please come to that um, just to encourage and love on Christy and just push forward uh, this next, this next uh, part of our, our, our children's ministry. Um, but with that, with that, um, we also have our marriage retreat going on and our beach retreat going on. Uh, those signups are still moving forward. If you have a child that would like to go to beach retreat, make sure to sign them up because, like I said before, we only have a limited amount of spots for uh, children and adults. Children and adults, we're going to try and take 20 um, if we can. If we ha- have to take more, we will, but there may be a waiting list if um, if if we don't get everyone signed up. So please make sure to sign up as soon as you can. It's $100, $50 deposit. If your child worked at the fish fry, though, their $50 deposit is taken care of. You only owe the 50 after that. So um, please make sure to get those signed up and also for our couples, uh, our marriage retreat signups as well so we can get those things planned forward. Um, I'm excited to have each and every one of you here this morning, church family. We're about to go into more of our worship time And before we do that, I would just ask if you could just bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Lord God, I just thank you for who you are this morning, Lord. I just pray, God, that, that in the light of everything that's going on in our world, Lord, we know that you are still God. That, Lord God, that you are still taking care of us. That, Lord God, that you still have a plan and a purpose because you are a faithful, faithful God. I just pray, Lord, that you would just help us to set aside everything this morning, Lord, and just praise you, worship you for who you are this morning, for your faithfulness, Lord. Help us, God, to lay down our lives. For it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all stand and sing. Great are you, Lord.
sing this song when I was a little kid. My teacher taught us the first verse of this as a third grader, and it stuck with me, but there's a fourth verse that just applies to us so heavily right now. So sing, My Country, Tis of Thee. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let free. protect us in these times of, of foggy vision in the front, but we don't understand what's happening next. We don't know why these things are happening to us as they're happening to us. But Father, we ask that your name be known in them. We ask that you show us how to love, like you told us how to love through Paul, Father. That we hope all things, that we believe all things, that we endure all things, Father. And that your, again, that your, your name is known in our lives. Cast us aside so that when people look at us, they only can see you. And they, they, they are confronted with you when they speak to us, Father. We ask that our words sound like your words this morning. We ask that our, our, our hearts are tuned to your heart and the message that you bless it like you never have before. In Jesus' name we pray. All right, it's so good to uh, see all of you here today, and uh, thank you for coming this morning. And welcome everybody by way of uh, Facebook. Hopefully you were, you were there looking at us this morning. Hopefully we're looking at you, so it's a good thing. If you have your Bibles, I want you to take a look at two scriptures, one in the Old Testament, the other in the New Testament. So let's stand as we look at 2 Chronicles 7, 14, and then 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. And it's one that you, you guys know. I, I preached on this before, but you know what? This is going to be very, uh, I think, uh, meaningful for a day like today that we're living in. Let me give you a little bit of background. God has given the people of Israel an option. You're going to be taken over by an adversary. You're going to be taken over, overrun by another outside country. But there's a way around that. Here's the way around it. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. As we take a look over at uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, he is addressing the church, the church issues. And he says in verse 17, the apostle Peter says, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Father God, thank you, Lord God, for this time of worship that we've had. Thank you, Lord, that our focus is upon the help that this land and the help that we need, and that is from you, the throne of God. Unless help comes from you, God, we're hopelessly lost. 
Unless the help comes from heaven, Lord God, our land will never be healed. Dear God, have mercy on us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Well, if you're a parent in this place, then you have done exactly what I have done and my wife has done over the years. Um, you know, when you have children, you know, generally speaking, we don't take our children to the doctor immediately. We, our, ch our child, if they're normally running around the house and they're busy and, and uh, they're into stuff and you're telling them to calm down, if they're all of a sudden kind of quiet, that's, that's an issue. Why are you so still? Uh, why are you just kind of sitting on the couch? You're not running around the house. Well, you know, you have to kind of sit back and be a little bit of a doctor. You've got to say, well, let's see, that's not normal activity. Our child must be, uh, come over here, let me feel your forehead. Oh, my goodness, you're running a fever. Well, you, you, you kind of diagnose that. And you say, well, we'll give you something for it and uh, try to help that fever a little bit. And you make them take a nap and... If they're still not better, then, then you kind of discuss it with each other and you might call your pediatrician and then they'll say, well, bring your child in and, and then you kind of go from there. You know, we're all a little bit like that. I think we all have to diagnose situations. If I had to diagnose the situation that we're in as Americans, I would say that our nation is sick. I would say that our nation is not well. I would say that our nation has issues and problems. Amen? Amen? And I would say that America needs a healing from Almighty God. If America is sick, then America needs a healing. The place that we've got to start, though, and if we're going to have a healing of our nation, and, and what does that look like? What does it look like that we have a healing? Well, one of the things that I think it will look like is there will be unity. And another place that I think that will look like is that we will turn from our wicked ways. And another way that it will look like that is there will be a spirit of love and there will be a spirit of, of, of trying to be better and not a spirit of division and a spirit of hatred and a spirit of strife and a spirit of all the stuff that's been going on. Folks, that is an indication that we're not well, but we need to be well. So where do we start? Where does the process of healing begin? Now, it'd be easy for all of us to look at the world that we live in and all of those who deny the name of Jesus, and we would say our nation is in trouble because of them. They're, it's their fault. It's, it's that we're sick because people are messing up spiritually and they're not right with God. And I would agree with you to a certain degree, but the Word of God says that if we're going to have a spiritual renewal, if we're going to have, if God's going to come to our rescue, then it's going to have to start with God's people. God's people. And, and so that gets to be very, very convicting on all of us. I mean, we're looking at it, we're seeing all the mess going on, we're saying, well, all right, uh, what about that? Well, God says, well, what about you? Let's start with you, Robert. Let's start with you, community. Let's start with you, Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Where are you? We talked last week that we uh, have spiritual passivity. Now, what I meant by that is that we're not willing to be aggressive and we're not willing to, to handle certain situations. And so I don't believe in passivity. I don't believe in passivity, spiritual passivity, or passivity as far as defense of our country or defense of our nation. And if you, and you say, well, preacher, what do you mean by that? It means if somebody breaks in my house, I'm going to defend my family. Please say amen. Let me try that again. If somebody's going to break in my house, I'm going to defend my family. Will you defend yours? Then you're not passive. You're not passive. So the idea is if the offense is, is that people are trying to tear down the structure of our nation and the structure of our church and, and trying to tear down everything that is right and good, then the only way we can do that is we oppose that. That means you're not spiritually passive. But here's the problem. The church is spiritually AWOL. What does that mean? It means we're not involved. We're, we're, we're kind of lazy in our spiritual pursuit of God. There are people staying home and not attending church. Uh-oh, did I say that? 
there, there are certain reasons why people stay at home. Don't turn your TVs off. I just said that, but that's, here's the thing. There's some people that need to stay at home. Amen? But I'm going to tell you what, if you've been staying at home before this virus took place, you're part of the problem. Amen? What about January? What about last year? Were you involved in church? Listen, there's people listening right now. You haven't been involved in church in years. There's a lot of you that you said, well, I had a problem with the church way back yonder. Let me tell you something. You're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. And I'd rather be involved in church life because let me tell you what, the institution of the church is what stands for righteousness and morals and we have the one answer. The answer is Jesus Christ. And so the church has a responsibility to get that answer out to this lost and dying world. But here's the problem. The church or the people of God have always had the challenge of who we follow. Let me go back to Israel again. Joshua brought the children of Israel out of um, out of the, the wilderness and into the land of Canaan, and they had all kinds of battles that they fought. And that at the end of his time as being a leader, he brought all the children together, children of Israel together, and said, all right, now I'm going to step down. We're going to go into a new phase. But he said, I've got a question for you. Joshua 24, verse 15 was his question. He said to the children of Israel, and I would say that this applies to the church, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, he says, but as for me and my house, we will serve God. You see, we've got to come as the people of God to a decision of whom we serve. Now, what does that mean? Serve. Serve. That means that Jesus is my master. Jesus is my Lord. He is the one in whom my allegiance goes to. Amen? I've always said just be right with God and everything else in the church has to be fine. Amen? So, so who are we serving? That's the question. See, sometimes the people of God can be compromised because our devotion can be to the things of this world. Listen, our devotion can be to the things of this age. Sometimes we put our trust in man. Sometimes we put our trust in political parties, our presidents, more than God. Amen? Amen? Again, that was kind of a weak amen. Let me try that again. Because this is really, a, if we don't get this, then I'm going to just close my Bible and sit down. If we don't, if we don't put, if we've got to have more devotion and more allegiance to God than man, political parties, presidents, whoever it may be. Amen? amen? We've got to because here's the thing. Man at his best is still sinful man. Imperfect man. I think that's half the problem. We've had a problem with people tearing down statues and everything like that. Maybe some of them need to be put in museums, but I'm telling you, whatever man that's ever been put on a statue is imperfect. Our leaders have been imperfect, but you know what? If you, if you have an ounce of historical value in you, you'll understand that America is still the greatest nation on the face of the earth. And it was put together by people who were trying to do the right thing, as imperfect as they were. Guys, we have a responsibility as God's people to decide who we're going to follow. See, it's my people who are called by my name. You know, we just went through that in Revelation 22. How important is the name of God? The Bible says in Revelation 22, verse 4, it says when we're in heaven that we shall see His face and His name will be on their foreheads. That's how important His name. I mean, we're labeled. Do you not like to be labeled? I don't like to be labeled. I, I, I don't Listen, either you're a Christian or you're not a Christian. Either you're labeled a Christian and you take that as a badge of honor. If you're ashamed of being a Christian, then don't call yourself one. Amen? Amen. 
Now, because Jesus calls us by name, and I love, I love this. In, in John chapter 10, verse 13, uh, Jesus made the statement. He said in John chapter uh, 10, verse 3, I'm sorry. He said, to him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name. That's why John sang that song. We are the friends of God. He calls us by name. Amen? He calls you by your name. He knows your past. He knows where you're going. He knows who you are. He calls you in spite of all your faults and, and failures and problems. He calls you. He draws you. The Bible talks about this in, in, uh, in, uh, in Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43 verse 1 says, But now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. God calls us to salvation by our name. I believe every one of us, before we got saved, God convicted us personally. He called us by name. He drew us. He wanted us. He wants us to be His children, as imperfect as we are. Because Jesus died for every one of us. Jesus redeemed every one of us. If we'll redeem, if we'll accept that redemption, if we'll accept that salvation, if we'll accept that forgiveness, it's bought and paid for. It's waiting on you to pick it up. It's waiting for you to receive it. Now, after salvation, brothers and sisters in Christ, God's called us to something else, and He's called us to serve Him. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, the Bible says that we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Does that offend you, that God's called you to salvation, and after you get saved, you're supposed to serve God? He's called you to good works. He's called you to get involved. He's called you not to be spiritually AWOL, but to be active, active in duty. Amen? But then he's also, y'all buckle your seatbelt for this one. He's also called us to not only salvation and service, but I'm going to use an old term that we don't use very often. It's called sanctification. Somebody says, well, I'm sanctified. You know what that means? It just means you're set apart for the purposes of God. You're set apart. You're, what does that mean? It means you're not like everybody else. Let me put it to you this way. You're not supposed to be like everybody else. You say, well, preacher, what does that mean? Well, it, it means this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that we don't read very often. Verse, verse uh, chapter 6, 9 through 11, here's what he said. And this is, this is the definition of a Christian, the definition of a believer in Jesus Christ. Here's what he says. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do, you, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen? You say, well, preacher, that's kind of tough. It is tough. Thank God for verse 11. This is the church now. And such were some of you. That's us. That's who we used to be. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. There it is again. Amen. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. See, a change has taken place in our lives, and there is, a, there is an affinity, there is a liking. <laughs> you like to live righteously now. You like to live in a way that pleases God now. You're repulsed by stuff that displeases God, or you should be. Amen? Amen? The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, how in the world are we brought closer into God's presence? Ephesians 5 describes the church and how that we're brought closer into God's presence. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, that he describes as the bride, the church. 
And he talks about it this way in a marriage setting, but he describes the church this way. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify. There it is again. Set her apart. No, do you get it? Do you understand that we're supposed to be different? Amen? We're set apart. We're different from the world. He said that we're sanctified and cleanse her by the washing of water by the word that he might present her, listen, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Do you understand what that means? Is it, is it crazy? But is it supposed to be that Christians are supposed to live a better life, a cleaner life, a more righteous life than they did before they got saved? Amen? You know, the problem is we're trying, and this has been the wrestling match that we've had for the last, at least the last 25 years that I've been pastor and before that, is the problem is, is we want the world to come into the church so badly that we've compromised and we've allowed ourselves to lower those standards. Listen, I've got news for you. I've got news for everybody listening. We don't have a right to lower God's standards. We don't, have to, we don't have the right to say everything's all right, just come on in here and live. How, no, sir. It's, it, God's called us to live a, a life of sanctification, a life that's set apart. You said, well, preacher, how important is that? It's very important. And I didn't put this in the notes, guys, but I'm going to throw this out. You can write this down. Psalm 66, verse 18. We forget that it says that. That if I regard iniquity in my heart, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Amen? It means if we're not repentant of our sin, it means if we are, if we are allowing, if, if we exalt sin, if we cover up sin, if we don't confess and forsake our sin, listen, God will not hear us. Any wonder? Any wonder why maybe the mess our country is in? Have you prayed for America? I have. I think the church is praying for America, but here's what I think the problem is. America needs the church to get right with God. The church needs to be right with God. We need to confess our sins. We need to search our hearts. We need to ask God, where do we need to change? He says in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves humble themselves. Now what does that mean? The word humility means a full realization that without the help of God, without the help of God, we're blind, we're lost, we're dead. Without the help of God, we can't go anyplace. Without the help of God, we can't do anything. Humility says that. Humility says, I understand. I understand I need God. And I'm going to humble myself. I'm, I'm going to bend a knee. As I said, and I've been saying all through this, don't ask me to bend my knee to you. Because if I bend my knee to you and you make me bow down, I'll resent it. But when I bow my knee to Jesus Christ, my allegiance to Him, through Him I will love you. Through Him I will forgive you. Through Him... I will live the life that I'm supposed to live. But it's only when I bow my knee to Him. If you're bowing your knee to something else, if you're submitting to the authority of some, you've got, let's put, it, let's put it biblical. If you're allowing other things to be your idols, if you're worshiping other things or people, then that's idol worship and God can't honor that. Amen? So my people need to humble themselves. Humility is so extremely crucial. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, 5 through 7, the apostle Peter said, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you, all of you be submissive to one another. Be clothed with humility. 
It says, for God resists the proud. Do you, you see that? God will not hear us when we pray because there's hidden sin. God will not hear us. God will not come in a, to our rescue. God resists the proud. That's kind of important, amen? I don't care. There's, there's people that I've known over my uh, some odd 45 years of being a Christian, and, and I probably have been one of them occasionally that I've had to repent of, is being spiritually proud. Well, I know more than others. I, I, I'm better than... No, you're not. You're not better. You're better off, but you're no better than anybody. We can be spiritually proud, but that's not what called us, God's called us to be. God's called us to be humble. God gives grace to the humble. Now, what does it mean? God gives, God gives grace. Let's keep reading here. How important is that? Verse 6, therefore, God, therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He says in verse 9, he's not telling the world to do this. He's telling Christians to do this. Resist the, it says resist him. Not the world. You, us. We resist the devil. Steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Are we resisting the enemy? Is there, I, I've said this before. If you, are, if you struggle in your Christian life, God bless you. That's a good thing. Ever want us fight the enemy? There's all the, the enemy does not want us to succeed. The enemy does not want us to be close to God. The enemy does not want us to do the things of God. The enemy tries to oppose everything the church should stand for. So we're going to have a battle. Amen? You know, for what it's worth, let me just say, I think one of the reasons why everybody wants to tear down statues in Washington, I've never been there. The people that have gone to Washington tell me that on just about every one of the monuments, there's Scripture. There's Scripture written on all the monuments. Doesn't that make sense? They want to tear down the things that may resemble goodness and righteousness and, and God. Amen? If anybody should stand up for goodness and righteousness and holiness, it should be us. He says, humble yourselves, and he says, pray. Pray. What is prayer? Prayer is seeking the face of God and seek my face. Seeking the face of God is seeking the pleasure of God. What pleases Him? What, what expression is, does, does the face of God exhibit about our lives? Is God pleased? Is He smiling? Or is He, or is he disappointed? Is he, does he, is, he, is he saying that you shouldn't live that way? See, praying is seeking the, the face of God, not your face. I tell you what. This society we live in, listen, I'm, I've said this before and I'll say it again. There's nothing wrong with being pretty and handsome. and Man, we all, we all love having haircuts, don't we? Amen, say about that. It's nice to have a haircut. <laughs> Natasha, thank God for you. <laughs> Nikita, I'm sorry, I should have said Nikita. I, I got that name wrong. Nikita, forgive me. But everybody likes a haircut. Everybody likes to, to look nice. But folks... Maybe we're looking at ourselves too long in the mirror. Maybe it's not about us, but maybe it's looking God in the face. Amen? Maybe it's, maybe it's seeking God's pleasure. Maybe it's seeking Him. Seeking what pleases God and not what pleases you. Acts chapter 4, verse 23 through 31. Let me set that story behind there. 
The Bible says that Peter and John were arrested and they were arrested for preaching the gospel and, and sharing the good news of Christ. And the Bible says, though, that the church was praying for them. Now, listen, what is, what is prayer supposed to do? I mean, it's, it's been so long. I mean, it, think about this. What, what does prayer do? Keep that in your mind. The Bible says that they were let go. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders said to them. So when they had heard that, they raised their voices to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. And by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord, against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before was done. Now, Lord, look upon their threats. And grant your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Notice the result of this prayer meeting. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, which means under the complete control of the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. Guys, you want to know the result of being right with God? The result of being right with God is that we speak the word of God with boldness. It says, seek God's face, pray and seek God's face. And then it specifically said to the people of Israel to turn from their wicked ways. I've actually had people debate that subject. They say, well, you know, Christians don't have to repent. Let me tell you, I, I, I don't know what Bible they're reading. But Christians, Christians, we must be right with God. We must repent. And the word repent means to turn away from and to turn to. And when we do that, we turn away from our actions that do not please God. And we live in a way that does please God. We seek to please the Lord God Almighty. Acts chapter 17 described the ministry of Jesus. In verse 30 of chapter 17 says, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained and has given assurance to, uh, of this to all by raising him from the dead. The idea is that, that it, is, it is preaching Jesus by the man, by the person, by the son of the living God. We're to preach Jesus. There is no other way to God. There is no other way to revival. There is no other way. If you want this country straightened out, it's got to be through the door, through the name, through the person of Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can bring about reconciliation. He's the only one that can bring races together. He's the only one that can appreciate authority and appreciate those who try to protect us. Only through Jesus can we have the wisdom to conduct the business in the way that pleases Him. The end of that prayer, He says, Then I will hear from heaven. See, I, I put in my notes, and I'm going to explain this. He said that, th that they must then you will hear from heaven. See, here's the problem. We're not hearing from heaven. See what heaven, listen, heaven must be in the church before we can go out into the world. Heaven must be in the church. There must be something here to offer the world that's better than what they've got. Amen. To be critical of us, sometimes I'm afraid there's not anything better. 
I think sometimes we don't have anything to offer. We ought to be able to offer them peace. We ought to be able to offer them a new life. We ought to be able to offer them hope of eternal life. We ought to be able to offer them reconciliation. We ought, they ought to see the church so unified. That is, it's an admirable thing. In fact, the Bible says in the book of Acts that they call them almost a slang. They meant it as a, as a byword. When they call the people of the way Christians, Christians. And you know why they, we were called Christians? is because we acted a lot like Jesus. Church, we've got to get back to acting a whole lot like Jesus. Amen? Then we'll hear from heaven. And, and we've, got to, we've got to share this gospel that, that heaven, heaven is, what, is what we can offer this world because what is accepting Jesus all about? Accepting Jesus is that, that He came to this earth. What was it about? What, what do I, when we preach about uh, at, at Christmas time, it's when heaven came down. It's when Jesus came down. It's when heaven itself came down in the person of Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 4, 4 through 7. So, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your heart, crying out, Abba, Father. Listen, verse 7 says, the result of salvation is this, therefore, you're no longer a slave but a son. You want to define what a Christian is? A Christian is, is a son and daughter of the living God. And then it even goes further, an heir of God through Jesus Christ. See, only heaven came down and only Jesus can heal our land. I want to go right on up to this other point. That when that happens, we seek God's face, we repent of our sin, then we hear from heaven. John, this is what we pray for every service, is that heaven comes down. That heaven's here. Let me tell you something. I, I just want to say it for what it, for, for, and I know you know this, but let me say this for everybody to hear. We don't come here to assemble because I'm such a great speaker and John's such a great singer. We come here because Jesus is here. And it's that fellowship in Him that attracts us. Amen? That's why we come. So you got a scripture to back that up? Absolutely. We're two or three gathered in His name. He said, I'm there. There's, there's something special when, when the people of God gather Jesus is, encourages the gathering. That's why we opened the doors up a couple of weeks ago. My own personal opinion, you don't have to listen to this. You can turn this off now. No. My personal opinion, that's why they're trying to tell the churches, now don't, don't assemble. Because we need to assemble. I need it. I said this Wednesday night, and, and again, I understand some people can't come, and I get that. We had 10 adults meet Wednesday night. And I walked out there, and I, was, I had a Bible study, and I was going to talk about it, but I said, let's, let's just talk a little bit. Let's talk about what's going on. The truth of the matter is they were all a little hesitant to, to talk. Well, that was unusual for community, wasn't it? I kind of had to kind of pull it out of them. I said, well, how, how do you feel about this? How's it going? And all of a sudden, you know what? We all began to talk, and you know what? We all felt the same way. And, and, and when we divided off and we had prayer, you know what we found out? We all felt a whole lot better. We're not a bunch of weirdos around here. We're all feeling the same way. We're all in the boat together. Amen. They'll make us think that we're strange, but we're not. We all see it with our own two eyes. The amazing thing is we left the building with a little extra 
jump in our step. We all felt a little better because, and I told him, I said, hey, you notice I didn't really talk, I, I, unusual as it was, I, I just picked a couple of verses and we spent about five minutes talking about those two verses and we spent about 20, 30 minutes just talking and praying. So it wasn't the great message, it was the fellowship. That's what made them feel better. Cameron, that's what makes the kids unite. It's when they come together, that's when you unite. There's something special. We get strength when we come together. Well, what happens? We hear from God. We hear from heaven. And then he says, that's when your sin will be forgiven. When you humble yourself, when you seek God, when you repent of your sin, then you will hear from heaven. Then he says, I will forgive your sin. See, that's kind of important. Church, I said this to them Wednesday night, and I'm going to say this to all of us here. Do not give in to hate, to anger, do not give, get, uh, give in to bigotry. Do not give in to racial division. Do not give in to blaming and, and, and being angry. Let me tell you something, folks. The answer to all of that is Jesus. Jesus will restore this nation. Jesus will forgive us of our sins. Colossians 2, 13 through 14. He says, And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He is made alive. Oh my goodness, man. The church, the, if we ever needed to be alive, it's now. It's when we seek His face and when God forgives us of our sins and then we're alive, we're alive. The world needs to see the church is alive. Having forgiven you all your trespasses. Listen what it's possible. Listen the message. Having wiped out the handwriting and requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, he has taken it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. The cross. The cross is still the answer. The cross. That's why Jesus died. Jesus died so that we can be forgiven and made right with God. Listen, but when we're made right with God, we then have it possible to be right with each other. And then, you know what happens after that? Healing can then take place. First, Peter again. Chapter 2, verse 24. He says, talking about Jesus, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. God wants to heal us as a nation. He wants to heal us. It's going to start with the church. When we're healed, we can show them what God can do. Amen. Amen. I've often thought about it. It's such a, an unusual thing. Why in the world would God pick uh, imperfect human beings to share the perfect news of the gospel? Why would He do that? You know, was that a mistake? God, did you make... Lord, you're using imperfect me to share the good news, the perfect message of the gospel? No. The, he didn't make a mistake in that. He's using us because we demonstrate what Jesus can do for the world. Amen. The world can be healed. The world can be forgiven. And we demonstrate that because of what they may see in us. If they see a healing in us, they think it then possible that they can be healed. That families can be brought back together. 
And you know what will happen? Not only that, but then our nation can be brought back together. You say, well, preacher, what does it mean as a Christian? Well, I know I'm going to heaven. What do you mean forgiveness of your sin? We've talked about it. First John 1 and 9, 1 9. Listen, church, we need to be sure that we're in fellowship with God. We need to be sure that we're walking with God. That's vitally important. It says over in Psalms, if, we, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Folks, we must be right with God. The Bible says if, if we confess our sins, then God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Church, let's make sure that we're right. Don't allow anger. Don't allow hatred. Don't allow bigotry. Don't allow division. Don't allow all that to gum up your spiritual life. You see, God wants to heal our land. And, and you may not, you know, I, some of us may be AWOL. We're not really up for that. We don't know if we want to do that. But I got news for you. God knows exactly what He's doing. Because this is what He said about you and I as His people. Matthew 5, verse 13. Jesus described us this way. He said, you are the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by man. He said, you, not, not him, you, the people of God, you are the light of the world. He said, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they lamp a, a light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. He says, to us, as His people, my people, God's people, the church. He said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. Let's come out of hiding. Let's, let's not hide anymore. Let's not be AWOL anymore. Let's do what God's called us to do. Our land, our country needs the church. This land, Harris County, Crosby, Humble, Atascacita, Texas, needs the church. The church has the responsibility to say, there he is. As John the Baptist said, there, there he goes. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Follow him and you'll be healed. Follow him and you'll be forgiven. Follow him. America will be healed. Bow your head in prayer. Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you would say at this time, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you would say at this time, I know for sure that when I die, I will go to heaven. I know for sure that I will go to heaven because I've accepted Jesus. And that's you. You know for sure you've accepted Jesus. You will go to heaven. Raise your hand. Amen. 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 God bless you. You, you can put your hands down. Some of you couldn't raise your hands. It's because you're not sure, but you want to be sure. I got great news for you today, this moment, right now, wherever you are listening to this message or in this church, you can know Jesus Christ. You can have assurance that when you die, you will go to heaven. You've got to accept Jesus. I, I can't do it for you. Your husband, your wife, your grandfather, your whoever can't do it for you. You've got to do it personally. Jesus died for your sins. But He will give you forgiveness if you let Him. If you'll receive Jesus by faith and pray a prayer in faith that says something like this. Right now, where you're seated, please say this. To Jesus. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sin. Lord Jesus, I'm sorry about the way 
I've lived my life. Lord Jesus, forgive me for every sin I've ever committed. Lord Jesus, I know you died on the cross to save my soul. Right now, Lord Jesus, I believe that you're the son of the living God. Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. I ask you to come into my life. I ask you to save my soul because from this moment on, I want to live for you and follow you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving my soul. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you prayed that prayer just a minute ago and you prayed it and you meant it, would you hold your hand up? Preacher, I did pray that prayer in a minute. God bless you. God bless you. You can put your hands down. In a moment, I'm going to have an invitation. That means where you get up out of your pew and you walk this aisle, and I want to pray for you, and I want to encourage you. By you coming, you're saying, I've accepted Jesus. If you prayed and you're listening to this in a house or a hotel or wherever you may be, you hold your hand up and you thank God for the salvation that he gave you. And as soon as you possibly can, you go to a Bible-believing church, you call a pastor, you call a Christian, you call somebody and tell them what Jesus Christ has done for you. Father, thank you for what you've done this morning. God, help people to come. Help people to come. Help Christians to come. Help us all to be right with you. Almighty God, in Jesus' name, amen. As we stand together, you pray to receive Jesus. I'm waiting for you. You come right now. You stood before creation. Eternity in your hand. You spoke. your head just for a moment we did this a few weeks ago and I want to do this one more time you may not be able to come and kneel at this altar but I'm asking the church that is here the church of the Lord Jesus Christ the Bible says if my people if my people will pray if my people will humble themselves guys I can't preach a sermon like that and not have prayer so I'm asking you right now if you can't come, I understand. Some of you may not be able to kneel, but those of you who can kneel and those of you that would like to come, come please at this altar or at this time. Come and kneel. If you can't, that's okay, I understand. 
but maybe just kneel where you're at if you, if you can't. Church of the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to just give you a moment to pray. Personally confess your own sins. Personally confess your own faults. Humble yourself before God. I'm just going to pray for all of us at this time. Merciful Heavenly Father, Lord God of the universe, Lord God of America, Lord God of this world, Lord God of Crosby, Lord God of Robert Williams, I come to you because, God, you're the only hope that I've got and this world has. Dear God, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my being AWOL at times. Forgive me, God, for me not being as bold as I need to be. Forgive me, Lord God, for not being as compassionate as I've needed to be. Forgive me, Lord God, for not speaking out when I needed to. God, forgive me for allowing the affairs of this world to take up my time more than the being devoted to you. God, forgive us all. God, help us to be as that father said, I believe, but help my unbelief. Forgive us for our lack of faith. God, our land needs you. Our church needs you. Texas needs you. This world needs you. Father, there's pastors and churches all around this nation that are burdened and there's people that are just in despair. God, help us to look to the God who raised up Lazarus from the dead. Help us to look to the God of heaven who raised up Jairus' daughter from the dead. God, help us to look to the God of heaven that cast out the demons in the man, the Gadarenean maniac. God, thank you, Lord, that there is no limitation to what you can do. Father God, forgive us. And now we ask you, God, to please heal our land. God, be with every policeman. Thank you for people who are willing to stand up and defend us and protect us. Be with every person that's in the military every branch of our military. God, I pray for every pastor and every church across this country, every Bible-believing church. God, help us to be salt and light. Help us to be what you've called us to be. Father, we ask you in Jesus' name, please heal our land. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for doing what we cannot do. Thank you, Lord, for the work that you're doing. Every discouraged person, every discouraged individual in the sound of my voice, may they know that Jesus loves them. May they know that Jesus can give them a new life. Lord, we ask you to cast out all discouragement. And I pray that hope and life would spring up in Jesus' name. Amen.